What was the last grade you could finish school? Say what? The last grade you could finish school. School in high school or whatever. whatever. Three years of college. Three years of college, okay. I'm assuming that this video is not the first true crime video you've watched. In which case, what I'm about to say will seem obvious. If you are a suspect of a crime, talking to the police will only make your situation worse. While the average fan of true crime is acutely aware of this fact, the average person is not. In fact, 80% of individuals who have their Miranda rights read to them choose to waive their rights and talk to the police against their own self-interest. The presence of readily available and high-profile police interrogation recordings online speaks to this statistic. And today, with most police interrogations being recorded, waiving your Miranda rights is essentially equivalent to consenting to your interrogation being made public. I've frequently questioned why suspects are so willing to forego their right to remain silent and right to legal counsel when confronted by detectives. Obvious answers that come to most people's minds include believing that police are only there to help, social pressure from authority figures, and a sense of superiority, such as thinking that one can outsmart the police. But an actual deep dive into the research on this subject has shed light on two other reasons for waiving one's Miranda rights and undergoing a police interrogation. One reason is simply misunderstanding your Miranda rights. Most Americans are not well versed on their constitutional rights and don't actually entirely understand the protection bestowed by the Fifth Amendment, even when read to them in the form of a Miranda warning. To further complicate matters, the average speed at which a police officer reads a suspect the Miranda warning is 268 words per minute. 31% faster than the average talking speed. This most certainly leads to a decay in comprehension. For many detectives, it seems, the reading of a suspect's Miranda rights is a mere formality that is best performed swiftly so as to get on with the day. Another possible reason Miranda rights are so frequently waived is a misconception that silence can be used against you. In one study on invoking Miranda rights, it was found that 31% of defendants incorrectly believed that silence or the avoidance of a police interrogation upon request would result in them having evidence used against them at trial, that evidence namely being the fact that they avoided the interrogation or remained silent during the interrogation. In fact, a suspect's silence is not commonly brought up as evidence in a court of law but even if silence is believed to be incriminating, a suspect can still speak to police with a lawyer present, thereby reducing the chances of self-incrimination. Yet this rarely occurs, indicating a widespread misunderstanding of the U.S. legal system. The 20% of suspects who actually do invoke their Miranda rights are usually either legally educated, avid watchers of true crime on YouTube, or have been through the system more than once. This last group is the least likely to waive their Miranda rights, as they have been previously advised by their lawyers or public defenders to avoid speaking to the police. This brings us to our current case study, that of the rapper The Baby, aka Jonathan Lindale Kirk. Kirk, having been arrested for shooting a man, concealed weapon charges, and narcotics violations, had all the experience needed to know that talking to the police comes with many detriments while providing no benefits. Yet on January 2nd, 2020, the baby would be detained by the Miami police under suspicion of robbery and would subsequently waive his Miranda rights. This is the story of a man whose ego, bolstered by having avoided severe legal penalties during his past infractions, being college educated, and being at the peak of his rap career, puts him at the risk of significant jail time simply by choosing not to invoke his Miranda rights. On January 2nd, 2020, Kirk, the baby, was scheduled to perform at Cafe Iguana Pines in Pembroke Pines, Florida. The arranged deal was a payment of $30,000 in exchange for Kirk's performance. Allegedly, Kirk met with the club's performer to receive his payment in cash. However, upon meeting Kirk outside Kirk's hotel, the club promoter claimed to only have $20,000 of the $30,000 payment. What is said to have occurred was Kirk threatening the promoter for the rest of the payment, followed by Kirk making good on his threat, with the promoter being beaten up and robbed. Kirk allegedly took the promoter's credit card, his cash, and an iPhone. 
While Kirk subsequently denied these allegations, video footage of the altercation exists. Unfortunately, YouTube won't let me show it for reasons of violence. The incident is on my Patreon account for anyone subscribed there. But for those who are not subscribed, let me just give you a quick rundown. The incident was caught on film by two different sources and put together, they tell the story pretty well, but neither definitively show the perpetrator to be Kirk. However, the tracksuit the perpetrator in the video is wearing is the exact same one Kirk wears in the police interrogation you're about to see. But prior to talking to the police, Kirk is clean from a legal perspective. The situation prior to Kirk's arrest is a your word versus my word situation, with the victim pointing the finger at Kirk and Kirk denying any involvement. Without an objective witness who can identify Kirk, the prosecution faces an uphill battle in convicting him. And thus, the detectives assigned to this case try for a confession via interrogation. It should be a long shot given Kirk's experience with the law. A wealthy rapper with a rap sheet should know better than to speak to the police. Of course, if this were the case, we'd have no video to watch. Alas, Kirk waves his Miranda rights, believing he can outsmart the police, and while he does play the game somewhat successfully, or some might say the detectives play their game not very well, as we will see shortly, Kirk is inevitably incriminating himself in this interrogation, giving the police cause that they previously had lacked. This interrogation, on the surface, seems to be Kirk beating the detectives at their own game, yet when you consider the alternative of remaining silent, we'll see that Kirk would have ultimately been better off evoking his right to an attorney. Okay. I'm going to read you your rights. Okay, I need you to acknowledge them as I read them. You have the right to remain silent. Do you understand that right? I need you to say yes. I don't, the reporter is not going to pick up. Uh, yes. Okay. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. Do you understand that? Absolutely. Okay. You have the right to talk to a lawyer for advice before we ask you any questions. Do you understand that? Yes. Okay. You have the right to have a lawyer present with you during questioning. Do you understand that? Yeah. If you cannot afford to hire a lawyer, one will be appointed to represent you before any questioning if you wish. Do you understand that? Yeah. You can decide at any time to exercise these rights and not answer any questions or make any statements. Do you understand that? Yeah. Okay, do you understand each of these rights as I explain them to you? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to check the yes box. Having these rights in mind, you wish to talk to us now. Yeah. Okay, do me a favor, sign right here on the X. Would you agree to speak to us? Next to your name, I need you to date it, January 2nd, 8.07 p.m. You know how they do for some drugs or alcohol right now, right? At this moment. Yeah. Okay, when was the last time you took anything drug or alcohol related? Last year. Last year. It should be noted that the date of the interrogation is January 2nd. Kirk's answer of last year was quite smart as it technically is correct, yet gives the listener the feeling that significant time has passed, when in fact it's only been a couple days. The detective's missed opportunity to call out Kirk on this answer really sets the tone for the rest of this interview. Throughout this interview, you will hear many lies by omission, statements that are true but hide essential facts, such as the fact that last year could have been as recent as two days ago. Kirk has a habit of giving statements that are technically correct, but simultaneously obscure the truth that the detectives are seeking. He actually does this once before the interview begins when the police are escorting him to the interrogation room. Kirk hints that the robbery chart is absurd because of him being on the Forbes list. The most common Forbes list is a list of the richest people in America, and this is likely the list that Kirk wants the police to think of. However, Kirk only appears on the Forbes 30 under 30 list, which is merely a list of successful people under the age of 30, without respect to financial wealth. Again, Kirk technically tells the truth, but with an ulterior intent. The detectives pass up this and several more opportunities to call Kirk out, requesting precise details. As you will see in this interview, a combination of sly word choice on Kirk's part, mixed with a low aggression strategy on the detective's part, leads to the police receiving relatively little information from Kirk. So you understand the questions that we're asking you and everything that we're speaking, speaking clearly to you? Yeah. Okay. What was the last grade you completed in school? Sure, what? The last grade you completed in school? School, in high school, or whatever. Three years in college. Three years of college, okay. 
We're just trying to make sure you understood everything. That's, right. that, that's up on my head. It might be said that detectives are underestimating Kirk's intelligence here by implying that he had not finished high school. Kirk counters with three years in college, with a tone that says, don't look down upon me. The initial paradigm of this interview seems to be one of mutual disrespect, with the detectives looking down on Kirk, perhaps because of his profession or because of his arrogant attitude. And Kirk responds by looking down at the detectives for asking him questions that demean him and questions to which they already have the answers. The atmosphere of this interrogation is quite different from what most detectives seek, one of false friendliness. At the very outset, Kirk's attitude tells detectives that the Reed Technique rapport building methods typically applied at the beginning of a police interrogation are not likely to be effectively applied here. Thus, the detectives have one extremely effective tool robbed from their toolbox. Okay. An incident occurred at the hotel, 1500 Southwest First Avenue, that you were there for, correct? What incident? An incident. You, you had an altercation with somebody? No. You didn't. Did you have a business dealing with somebody? No. You didn't? No. So somebody didn't bring you $20,000 in front of the hotel in your SUV? No. They didn't? No. Okay. Somebody had somebody bring $20,000 that wasn't theirs and lied to them and told them that it was for an event of theirs on the 31st and lied to them. That person, once he realized they were doing bad business, said nah and left for his $20,000. Okay, so you didn't count and got my contact information to do business the right way. That's what happened. The people that got y'all put me in because they the crooks, they the criminals. That's what I'm telling you. Okay, so you, you at this point in the interrogation, Kirk's position is nearly as good as if he had declined the interrogation. He denies knowledge of any incident occurring at the hotel, denies having an altercation, and denies engaging in any business. Yet his resentment from the non-existent business meeting gets the better of him, and he immediately feels the need to clarify that someone was engaging in bad business practices. His emotions got the better of him, hence Kirk throws out a lead to the detectives, and just like that, the detectives have an angle from which to approach the questioning. If the detectives had received a firm no to these questions instead of receiving volunteered information, they would have hit a dead end. Did you count twenty thousand dollars? Did you count twenty thousand dollars in your Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, what time was it? I don't know. Whatever time they chose. So you're saying that you weren't, you weren't. Whatever time, whatever time the camera showed me not robbing no damn body that time. Okay. Well, were you there? Was I where? At the location where the twenty thousand, where the twenty thousand thousand dollars were being assessed. I just told y'all they attempted to pay me $20,000 for somebody else's money, which I could have took. This is Kirk's first big mistake. In his prior description of the business meeting, he avoided using first-person pronouns, giving himself plausible deniability. That is, he made it known to the detectives that he was aware of the business meeting, but had not admitted his physical presence. However, Along with his agenda to portray the other side of the business deal as a so-called crook, Kirk affirms his physical presence at the meeting. Prior to this statement, the detectives did not have evidence to place Kirk at the scene of the crime. Now the police have reason to arrest Kirk. Remember that Kirk has been brought into the police station under suspicion of robbery. However, one commonly applied technique of police interrogations is to use the interrogation to coax out evidence to charge the suspect with a lesser crime will allow the police to further detain the suspect. The detectives currently lack evidence necessary for a conviction of a robbery, evidence such as Kirk being in possession of the victim's credit card or iPhone. However, they now have enough evidence to hold Kirk for battery. Were Kirk to have insisted that he was not present at the place of the crime, he would have likely been released. However, his agenda of portraying his business partner as a shady person prevails over his agenda of walking away from the interrogation freely. In his word salad of bad-mouthing his business partner, he lets it slip that he was physically present at the crime scene. 
they tried to give it to me. I was well, once I saw that it wasn't good business being done. Uh, nah, uh uh-uh, uh, what's going on? Y'all clear up what y'all got going on? They couldn't clear it up because they were doing bad business. Okay, so Not only they, they, they wasn't, they was doing bad business from the get go. And when the person caught on to them doing bad business, he got his money from them and he left. And he got the contract information to book me the correct way. Okay, who is he? I don't know. You got to ask them what they bring. They bring. I don't. I don't know the two dudes that was there. No names, no nothing. No, I know the name is in my phone. It's been texting me, blowing me up all day. Okay, trying to swindle me. The nigga who y'all who, who got enough credibility to make the Miami police department to put me in custody, got me probably even questioning me. Okay, oh my God, do I look like I need to take anything from anybody? Come on, let's come to search. Common sense. Common sense. You know what I made to even be down here? The promo- a promoter booked me at that hotel. I didn't pay to be at the hotel. I was paid for. You let me on my room, you would have saw close to a quarter billion dollars cash legally. A hard earned money. I don't got to take nothing from nobody, bro. Well, let me ask you this. Do, do, I will go outside here right now and throw $10,000 in the air. Like, I do not care about it. Kirk emphasizes the amount of cash he has as a way of arguing that he could not have robbed the victim. His reasoning is that he has so much money that were he stiffed $10,000, it would be nothing to him. In other words, Kirk has no motive for robbery. However, the prosecution does not need to prove motive. Having a motive can be useful for the prosecution in that it helps convincing a jury, but a motive is ultimately not necessary for a conviction. Because Kirk does not know this, He is speaking a lot in an attempt to prove lack of motive, which is good for the detectives, but not for Kirk. I don't. Was there an argument? No, it was an argument. I didn't argue with a soul. I didn't argue with a soul. My voice was never raised. It was never aggressive language for me. None of that. Was there a fight? None of that. No, I ain't seen no fight. And nothing's taken. We shouldn't be in no robbery here, bro. So when y'all get done doing what y'all doing, y'all need to do y'all job, y'all need to follow y'all process, and y'all need to arrest whoever gave y'all these false allegations, bro. This bullshit. This bullshit, bro. This shit that cost me already $50,000. Already. Already, bro. Bullshit. This shit is bullshit, bro. It is. This is bullshit. Okay, where were you at? I don't know. Hey, calling my phone. I don't know where I was on Thursday. I'm not keeping track of where I'm at because I'm not out here living the wrong way, bro. Okay. When I encountered you in the hotel, you came back to the uh, the concierge, the counter. Yep. Where were you coming from at that point? Uh, prime seafood. Prime, 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 whatever, whatever the hell. I went to eat. I went to get some food. Where is that? I don't remember. You don't know? No. How'd you get there? In the car, bro. What kind of car? Was it a car you drove, somebody else drove? <laughs> a Uber, bro. A Uber? Yeah. What kind of car was it? A Uber. Small car, SUV, truck, what? I don't know. Most viewers will surmise that Kirk is lying about taking an Uber to go eat. The detectives have too. Upon discovering a potential lie, detectives will ask for details, both to disprove the lie later and to lock the suspect into a specific story that is likely to be contradicted later. The natural inclination of a lying suspect is to follow the detective's lead, specifying details. Studies in psychology have shown us that liars believe that adding more details to a false story makes it believable. Kirk intelligently avoids this trap. Instead, he just gives up on the lie, throwing his hands in the air and saying, I don't know. In a normal conversation, we might feel vindicated, as if we had just caught Kirk in a lie. But in the interrogation room, Kirk made the right decision, redirecting the detectives to the crime itself. More suspects should employ this method, in my opinion. It's like an interrogation room karate move. Just throw your hands up in the air, exclaim, I don't know, and you will have successfully befuddled the police. It's really a move with no downsides. Good job, Kirk. Still, Oddly enough, the detectives choose not to press Kirk on the details, though they easily could have. The detectives could have requested Kirk's Uber history or called the restaurant to confirm his alibi after obtaining more details about Kirk's actions prior to the crime. Whether it can be attributed to a mistake on the detective's part or the power of Kirk's charisma is up for debate. Let's talk about what matters. 
Just about That's what why we're here. Talk about what y'all need to get me about this. What I'm driving in the car, what I went to go eat, what time I went, that don't got nothing to do with the fact I ain't robbed a damn show. Me, nobody around me, ain't nobody robbing let's, nobody. Let's, let's take the word robbery out of the picture. So while we here, we taking the word out, robbery out of the picture, the y'all too. Y'all are uh, robbery detectives. This is robbery unit. That's, some, the, that's the second word today. he said. That's the second word he said when he came in here. Robbery. Come on, bro. I like this response from Kirk. It's quick and witty, but it unfortunately also puts Kirk's ignorance on display. Because as stated previously, he is here at least for the crime of battery. The detectives again were sloppy here by revealing their hand via the statement, let's take robbery off the table. He told me, he asked a question to me about a robbery when I walked in my hotel. Uh, robbery? I had every answer to the question you needed right there. Whoa, that ain't it. That's false. Okay. I, throw that out the window. We talking about robbery, bro? It's nothing for me to talk about. I didn't rob. So nobody. do you think that we, that we just woke up this nobody. morning and decided to just... I think y'all got a phone call from somebody, from somebody. That, 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 that's already a liar. I know they're a liar. Got a phone call somebody that's a liar and y'all bought it. Y'all believed it. Y'all got me in here and y'all put me in handcuffs. Brought me outside the hotel in handcuffs. Cameras and shit all on me. Come on, bro. This shit is bad for what I got going on. And I ain't even do shit to that, man. They the crooks. They the crooks. They already they already mentioned it. $20,000 of somebody else's money. They, they, they tried to act like... What so they so you're telling us that that whole incident happened... Well, so so the, the whole point about this, we're talking about the same thing. We're talking about when, when we're talking about janky promoters, bro. Well, okay. That's what okay. we're talking about. That's what I'm talking about. Talking so about you're, you're, you're talking telling me that whole incident happened. We're talking about criminals. Um, when, when I do business, is legally is legal is legally binded. It's legally binded. Okay. Everything I do, you have to sign a contract. Kirk continually refers to crooks and criminals as a form of misdirection. He believes that portraying the other side of the business deal as a party likely to engage in crime will make the detectives shift their focus away from Kirk. However, this strategy proves useless as the detectives have already interviewed the other side of the business deal. Indeed, the other side is the victim and the one who filed the police report that led to Kirk being detained. There is simply no one to follow up on, which is why the detectives are not seriously requesting more information on the so-called crooks. Instead, they humor Kirk with a few questions about the business deal, hoping that he will reveal new information about his involvement in the hotel meeting. We got to sign a contract. Okay, it's so a contract so right now. That whole incident happened and nothing, nothing went wrong. Nothing, nothing happened. There was no. Not, not to my knowledge. There was no fight. There was no scuffle. There was no. I ain't fight nobody. I ain't fight nobody. Bottom line. Okay. Listen, how I am, I ain't fight nobody, I ain't take nothing from nobody. Them the only two questions is that I should even be getting asked from. So why would someone say that you did? You gotta bring him in here, ask him that. Bring him in here, but it don't matter. It, regardless of, of, of what y'all got going on, see, this is why this is why you, you do business the right way, which is not the way they was doing it. Well, his name's on a contract, bro. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sue him anyway. What was his name? name? Is I'm going to sue him anyways. Whoever y'all talking to, whoever you, you tell me his name. Who would you sign a contract with? Well, I don't sign the contracts. I'm the performer. I don't sign the contracts. So your management team signs the contract? Yes. Who signed? The, who in your management team signed a contract with who? They don't no, tell you who you don't. We ball. don't sign the contracts. We draw them up. I just told you he signed. The so who's he? Y'all let me know, bro. When y'all done with the with the mind game questions, bro? I don't have time for There's this. No no who is. Whoever made the report? There's no mic. Whoever made the report. Whoever made the report, bro. Y'all don't gotta act like y'all know less than what y'all know. Whoever made the report, but y'all know it's too much. Uh, y'all know too many lies. You get what I'm saying? That's why y'all gotta move backwards like that, bro. Like you're saying, you're saying, that they're, you're saying that they're lies, but you don't, you, you don't know what we, what we have. Don't know. Okay. That's I know, what, what, I know, y'all, I, I know if y'all had proof of me robbing somebody, we wouldn't even be talking. Y'all would have cuffed me. I would be charged with it. That's what I know, bro. This is actually false. Even if the detectives have undeniable proof of Kirk's guilt in the robbery, they would still engage in an interrogation. 
From a resource perspective, this is because a confession is significantly more cost-effective than undergoing litigation to prove a suspect guilty to a jury. It is wrong to assume that if police want to talk to you, they have no evidence against you. In fact, police will often purposefully conceal what they have as evidence, dangling it as bait for suspects who want to talk to the police as a way of understanding just how much and what kind of evidence the police are holding. In other words, it's bait for people who want to know how much trouble they are likely to be in. The detective in this interrogation attempts just this, actually, in stating, you don't know what we have. Of course, this fishing expedition fails right at the outset, as Kirk immediately makes it clear that he believes the interrogation itself is proof that detectives have no evidence on him. Ironically enough, the detective's strategy fails due to Kirk's ignorance of the interrogation strategies. That's what I know. I ain't no fool. My side of the story. My side of the story is I ain't, I ain't done that. I don't have a side to the story because I ain't done nothing to nobody. Bro. So that's what I want and, to so and before something could be happened, done to me, happened, right? and before something could be done to me, I realized I was dealing with, with uh, uh, bad business. And I Why did you say it was bad business? What? Why you say it was bad business? I already told y'all that you want to rewind this. You know, I did, bro. I already told y'all, bro. My story not gonna come out different no matter how many times I say it, bro. Another extremely impressive interrogation karate move from Kirk. This one too should go in any suspect's repertoire. You want me to tell you the story again? You want me to repeat what I said? Why don't you just rewind the tape? You're recording this, right? Classic. Kirk knows the room is being recorded and refuses to answer the same questions more than once. In this way, he avoids trapping himself into two different stories and avoids giving detectives conflicting information. Kirk thus completely sidesteps falling prey to the common interrogation strategy of asking a suspect to repeat his story several times so as to find inconsistencies. In addition, his insistence that detectives already have the story on film let the detectives know the future attempts to employ this strategy will fail, likely being met with a demand that they simply rewind the tape. From here, detectives have few strategies left, and the best they can likely do is to find new topics via which to elicit novel information from Kirk. But ultimately, this strategy of saying, just rewind the tape, is, is genius, and it's going to get him out of the interrogation room way more quickly than most suspects would normally get out. It's not, bro. It's right here. So you press stop and rewind and play, I'm going here. I said it was bad business, bro. Come on, bro. This nigga blowing my phone up. I was eight all night. He needed my help for his event. He already was in, in deep water because he's already doing, and I see why, he's already doing bad business. You see what I'm saying? He has an event that wasn't going to go as planned. He needed me to make up for that. He needed me to cover his ass, so he brought in another person, lied to him, swindled him. He thinking he coming to book me for a whole different event, and they tricking him, got him paying me to come do a walk through the night. Come on, bro. He niggas full of shit. They ain't no point of me trying to trying to uh, help do pissing on a wild goose hunt to see who that is. And matter of fact, check them cameras. Y'all got crime scene investigation unit out there. Check the cameras. You see him meet up with somebody else in the lobby. Ask him, hey, who is that? Ask him. Follow up on what I'm telling y'all. That's what we're trying to do. I mean, shit. It, it, I mean, shit. It, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, I would expect people to act on common sense anyway. Y'all got plenty of sense. Y'all not stupid. Y'all the police, bro. I'm not. Do I look? Come on, bro. I don't know why I'm still talking, bro. I don't know why I'm still talking. I don't, bro. I don't. So whatever y'all want to do, bro, come on. Hey, I got to go, bro. I got a life to live. I got to go. So whatever y'all want to do, come on, let's do it. Let's do it. What do you mean? Let's do whatever y'all want to do. I don't even want to talk about this bullshit. I'm going to get this bullshit. Bro. Okay, so this is bullshit. For what? For what? We're not getting away, bro. Right. At this point, Kirk has made it pretty clear that he's done. He's done giving information. He's done. He may as well just join the cast of 90 Day Fiance. Of course, the detectives can attempt to press some more, but their experience is probably telling them that further questioning is a lost cause. And while Kirk has talked considerably less and given much less information than the standard suspect in a police interrogation room, he still has given the detectives enough information to charge him with battery. Unsurprisingly, this is exactly what the detectives do. (laughs) 
After letting Kirk know that he will be placed in jail, the detective takes a Hail Mary approach at gaining access to Kirk's hotel room, most certainly for the purpose of collecting evidence for the robbery charge. However, the way by which the detective requests entry to Kirk's room is purposefully unclear. Perhaps the suspect's trusting of the police would easily comply, but the convoluted way in which the detective presents the question only makes Kirk more suspicious. Moreover, the tone of voice, body language, and manner of speech the detective is using are misaligned with the suspect. The communication method that the detective is attempting to apply here with Kirk is one that you use after building rapport with a suspect. But having built no rapport with Kirk over this interrogation, the detective once again sees his strategy fail. No one's going to touch it. Okay? That's one route. The other route is if you have someone that you want to give permission to someone else that's not the police to give permission to, to go into the jail. Which is your choice. Why well, I can't go get my stuff? Because you're going, you're going to jail today. Okay, I'm going to get out. I'm sorry? And then I'm going to get out. So you don't want us to, uh, to you just want us to lock the doors and leave everything? Like what door? With the hotel. They said the doors were already locked. Okay, so you want us to leave it the way it is and let, uh, and you, you, you'll get it when you get out. It's going to be in the room when I get out. We haven't, we haven't gone in your room. Your room. I'm saying there's no stuff going to be in the room. I That's what I'm saying. We, how can I guarantee that? They already guarantee me that when before. This is what I'm saying, bro. That's what I'm saying. What I'm telling you is, how can I guarantee that if I'm I'm not there they to make sure no one goes, no one else the goes. The one that just ain't walk back in here with you, he already guaranteed me that. That what? That I can go back in there and get my stuff. Yes, yeah, yeah. You, you can do whatever you want once you get out of jail. But what I'm thinking about is between the time you're in jail and the time you get out, uh, the things that you have there. It's up to you what you want to do. I don't know nobody else going in this stuff. Okay, so you don't want the police going in there. Nobody. Okay, you just want your room door locked. <laughs> Another thing, which, which I forgot, I don't know, you know, what's your policy? You can't guarantee anything. Which, you know, your door is locked already. I can guarantee you we're not going to go touch your shit. But I'm just, I'm just, I'm just thinking ahead for, for on your behalf. Mm -hmm. So just leave the door locked and... 
Kirk successfully calls the detective's bluff that the police just want to make sure that Kirk's belongings are safe in his hotel room. And with that final failed attempt at confusing Kirk to allowing police access to the hotel room, the detective gives up. Kirk is subsequently placed into jail and charged for battery. Charge that will ultimately be dropped thanks to Kirk's lawyer's own karate moves. Let me conclude with a message to all current and future criminals. This is actually not my message, but comes from one of the greatest minds of the 21st century. I quote, You can do your thing, shorty. It's okay to floss. But there's still one rule, player. Don't get caught. For everything you've gained and everything you've lost, there's still one rule, pimpin'. Don't get caught. For every hoe you hit, dog, and every hoe you tossed, there's still one rule, player. Don't get caught. And you can ride clean, shorty. You ain't gotta walk. But there's still one rule, player. Don't get caught. But if you do get caught, keep your fucking mouth shut. Thanks for watching. Special thanks to my Patreon subscribers. I hope to see you all again soon in my next video.